righty. Welcome to Bungalows for Bachelors number three. Today we are going to be discussing structural design. Let me go ahead and pull it up. And we will get right into it. All right. So we are still in phase one pre-construction. Last time we talked about architectural design and how we want to get a plan that shows us what the house is supposed to look like. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going to be inside the house structure. What is specifically going to uh, describe how we are going to build this particular house in this particular shape. That's what structural design is for. So what is a structural plan? The, p the page you see in front of you is a piece of a framing plan set that covers uh, just one piece. There are normally three, three aspects of a structure, a regular house to look at. The first one's going to be the foundation. That can be a slab on grade. It can be a pier and beam. It could be a combination of a, of a few different things. Um, those plans are going to describe the concrete mix, the rebar spacing, the size of rebar in the, in the foundation beams or in the footings or whatever it may be. Um, and that is going to be a foundation plan. That's sort of a separate thing from the framing, which is what we're going to look at here. And of course, there's a framing plan. And the third thing is a wall bracing plan or a wind bracing plan. It's kind of the same thing. The basic premise of that plan is to prove that if you build the house a certain way with, let's say, throwing plywood or OSB sheeting on the whole exterior of the house, you're basically proving just with some numbers that the house indeed could withstand whatever wind load or earthquake load it's designed for, wherever that may be. So today we're going to look at the framing plan because that is uh, a very important one, and it's it's most of what is can be tricky about building a house. So I'm going to open this up and I'm going to make sure that the share is looking at it. Alrighty. So this is the first page. The title block and all the personal information has been wiped out because this is um, a real project. Um, but over on the left side is which is a, a materials list this is going to list the main structural component of the lumber the main beams that are in the house this is a useful list to have uh, that you would send to your lumber yard so you don't have to necessarily calculate the costs of these things we'll talk a lot more about uh, material quantities and things later when we're talking about estimating but this is something that if somebody gives you it can be very valuable and you just send these things off and they send it back with the price. And that's normally how that goes. Um, in the center here, what you're looking at is actually the roof plan. The roof plan from the framing perspective is going to describe what are you going to use for rafters? And the rafters are going to be the, uh, the horizontal running that are uh, horizontal running boards that are pitched up to make the roof. Those are the rafters. It's going to describe what those are made out of, what the spacing is going to be. In this particular plan, they've been actually individually labeled with lengths. So it's been made clear that, okay, this particular house had a uh, 312 pitch roof sloping down to the left right there. And there's going to be three individual boards that make up one like run of rafter. So when you're looking top down here at this roof plan, um, uh, the it's basically one, one big roof plane. Right here, it's all sloping down left, one big shed roof. And this is how it would be built. And you can see that as the as the walls and bracing locations change, the lengths of these boards change. When these are selected, they are they're they're labeled such that you know if you buy a 10-foot board, it'll be long enough to get this proper overlap and stuff like that. And notes on overlap and that kind of thing is normally written in the notes somewhere. Here's some detail about how that's done. But this is the roof plan. It's gonna describe what members are going to use to make the roof structure and where you're going to brace the roof structure. So it's basically designed that, um, I think this guy, 
says all rafters to be two by 10 southern yellow pine number two or better spaced at 24 inches on center unless noted otherwise so this is 24 inches on center and it was two by two by tens were specified in here not because they needed to be for strength but actually because the client wanted them that big for fitting in more insulation so that was why those were sized a, a two by six would have been just fine to span from this this wall over to this bracing line and over to this bracing line and over to this wall that would have been fine but he wanted them for insulation so that's basically what you're looking at there is a legend down here that would explain um the the thick line would be a beam supporting the roof a beam is going to be uh, some kind of usually built up member something big and strong that's going to sit on one wall and it's going to sit on another wall and it's going to catch a bunch of weight either weight from the ceiling weight from the roof something like that so these these thick dark lines here are these are these beams that are going to span from this little corner over to this wall and then there's going to be another one from this wall over here so there's some notes here about like roof overhang framed per this detail on the detail sheet that kind of stuff so these little angle circle guys these are roof braces this is how you would notate that okay normal code is going to be that you run a a horizontal board the same as the rafter size this way up and down and you're going to support that board every four feet or so and if you have a wall to put it on then it's nice and easy in this case over here there was no wall in this plan to put it on so we put a beam up above the ceiling and they can put stuff on it so that's that's the roof plan there's a there's a whole lot of detail to be discussed in a structural plan and of course this is just 2d might not make a lot of sense now but when we go into advanced stuff later it will make more sense the next sheet has the ceiling plans on it the ceiling plans are effectively where it's going to describe uh, the rest of the beams and where they go and any floor joist sizes or ceiling joist sizes the biggest difference between a ceiling joist and a rafter being the ceiling joist is going to be flat a rafter is normally a pitched board but sometimes ceiling joists are pitched if they are in an inside sloped ceiling it can can be that way but these are the the ceiling joists are going to be the things they're installing the drywall to up above your head and the rafters are normally the things they're going to put the roof on top of so in this case this was a three-story house it was a rectangle with a garage on the first floor a stairway to go up the next floor the second floor was the main living area with a big open space which is why you see lots of big beams here these dark lines these are big beams they have to we had to support all this weight above this open area so we have to hide we have to try to hide these beams in his floor system so that he cannot see them and also you know, put them in a smart place so that loads are distributed to the house in a smart way. So the w the one way to look at this would be you look at the third floor ceiling, which is right below the roof, and here's the two beams that were holding up the roof that we talked about. This beam is two one and three quarter by eleven and a quarter by fourteen inch LVL. Uh, an LVL is just an engineered lumber board, it's a special board. And you put two of them together, glue them and nail them, and it becomes a beam. And you put one on this wall, put one right here, and um, there are details on if you can, if you want to put it flush with the ceiling, if you want to raise it above, raise above the ceiling, you can do that. But there's there's the beams, and what you're going to notice is that as soon as you start putting beams in a house, you're going to start concentrating loads in your house. So on this third floor, what we've done is we've put two beams landing right here in this one spot on the wall. Well, that means that when that spot is when there's a floor underneath that wall, then we're going to have to catch that somehow because you don't want to just put that load on nothing. You need to catch heavy weight. So right here, this little circle X thing means that, oh, there's a big load right here. So that's why we're going to catch that load with a beam with a post here and a post here. So on this floor, you're going to see two exposed posts that are going to help carry this load and keep the beam somewhat small. So those posts are going to produce heavy weight on that floor system, and those need to be caught here. So this one's going to land in the wall, so it's fine. And this one's going to land on this post or wall, depending on what they, what they put here. So these are ways of looking at 
how are you accumulating weight and putting it in certain places as you go down through the house? You can see here that um, this beam right here, this horizontal beam, five and a half inch by 19 and a half inch by 20 foot glue lamb beam. Uh, glue lamb is just another type of engineered lumber. It's basically a bunch of horizontal flat boards that have been glued together and they're very large and very strong and they carry a lot of weight. So all that weight is right here into this wall, which is why a specific post was specified to carry the weight of this beam. If you put three two by six studs together, it will be sufficient to carry the weight of this. And then on this first floor, the load is still coming down through the wall. So I said, again, make sure that you have your post right here to catch that weight all the way down the foundation. Because the basic premise is when you start accumulating a lot of weight, you want to put solid wood under that weight all the way down to whatever foundation it is that you have, all the way down into the dirt, at least or until you get concrete. So this is the... This, the ceiling plans. There's ceiling joist notes in here. There's sort of wall post notes in here. There's beam sizes. There's lengths of floor joists. For example, that if you buy a 26 foot joist, it's going to reach all the way across this building. Um, these smaller dashed lines are headers. These are the things that are going to go over the windows and doors that, that carry weight from above. This guy had some special header details drawn out here. He had a very special plan. Um, just uh, a ways to get a more efficient wall and still carry loads. Down here, we got another legend. It's going to say, okay, this is a header. This is a beam. This little dude right here is a beam hanger. A beam hanger is normally like a metal metal plate of some kind that's got nails in it. It's going to connect to the beam. It's going to connect to something else. It's a way to support a beam necessarily without having to put the beam down on top of something. Um, just a line for a ceiling joist, a dashed line for a floor joist, a thick dashed line for a floor blocking line. That kind of thing is going to be done like right here where you have a long span of some joists and you don't want them to get too wobbly in the middle, so you block them. And that basically keeps them from rest restrains them from moving and twisting around. Um, same thing over here. You don't really want to go over eight feet without blocking a floor joist. So that kind of stuff is in the ceiling plan. A majority of the framing information is going to be here in the ceiling plan. Um, the rest of the information is mostly notes and general information on how to frame houses and connect things in general. If I keep going, you will see that the next sheet is the next sheets are all detail sheets. So these aren't specific to this particular house. These sheets basically say, when you're building a house, you should do this. And a lot of this text is straight out of the International Residential Code. There's nothing special in here. Um, an example would be like a, oops. Oops, I'm short here. The design and construction. The roof and ceiling assembly shall provide continuous ties across the structure to prevent roof thrust from being applied in supporting walls. So that's basically discussing this situation where if you load this roof without proper bracing underneath, it's going to try to push these walls apart on the end. So it's going to keep them tied together all the way across, basically. That is an older, older note, but that's basically what this is. This, the fastening schedule describes typical ways to nail things together. So when you want to, for example, nail a ceiling joist down to the wall, the top plate of the wall, you can use any one of these nail combinations to be up to code, and it's going to tell you the spacing and location. So per joist, you're going to toenail three three-inch by 0 0.131 nails. So a three-inch by 0 0.131 nail is a common um, nail gun size nail. So it's just going to say you're probably going to do two on one side, one on the other, and just nail the ceiling joist down. Same thing with roof rafters and, you know, descriptions of connecting wood to wood. And then this is describing wood sheeting panels. Like if you're going to nail down plywood, stuff like that, use this size nails. This spacing on the edges of the panel, this spacing in the center of the panel. So just got a whole bunch of whole bunch of details on, on ways to build things and connect things. And um, in this particular case, this is a very uh, wind-resistant overhang design so that the wind, a uh, high wind event can't rip this off your house stuff like that over here is information about 
roof braces when they become really long you're supposed to make them out of bigger wood than just some two by fours um but yeah this is a this is a notes sheet this is the roof notes sheet the next notes sheet is like the floor notes sheet describing if i have to make a hole in the floor for something i'm going to do a certain thing to those floor members you have to be more careful when you're using not regular lumber you have to use special things when you're using engineered lumber not quite designed the same way, but it's describing basically if you use a regular piece of board, you can notch it out, you can do certain stuff to it, and it's fine. Um, again, here's more nailing for, for floor connection type nails. Next sheet's going to be ceiling, a wall framing. It's going to describe some special wall details, regular wall details. On regular wall studs, you can drill holes, you can make notches. What are the allowances on that? What are the, what are the things you're allowed to do to a wall? Here's a bunch of things on how to nail a wall together, top or bottom plate to stud. So when you're when you're nailing walls together, you're gonna put this many nails through whatever it is you're you're, you're doing. So it's just basic basic information. That's if you don't know where to start, this is just a great place to start. And this is all mostly in the International Residential Code. So if you want to read through it, you will learn a lot about how normally people how normal people build houses. And the last sheet is. The last sheets are just more drawings and more details that describe proper ways to hold things up. So if I have a beam cross section up here, this is describing that if I pick the beam up really high, I need to brace the beam so that nothing can fall over in the attic. This is describing splicing rafters if they're too long, hanging ceiling joists underneath a beam, stuff like that. And that's the end of this plan set. So let's go back. All right. See if we can switch. There it goes. So that is a structural framing plan. It's going to describe a whole bunch of stuff. There's a lot to unpack out of a plan like that, and it, and uh, we will go into much more detail later on. But that's that's sort of what that's going to look like. So what is a structural engineer? Well, a structural engineer is, is basically somebody who's been to college. They, they've had four years in college. They had four years of experience outside of college, and they have a license to, to practice this structural engineering. Now, you can learn a lot about this kind of math and this kind of stuff and know how to do the same things that a licensed engineer would do. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't know how to do it, but it does mean that if a jurisdiction requires that a licensed engineer signs off on something, then you're not going to be able to do that. Um, so they are people who have taken the time to learn and uh, retain liability for special designs and things like that. They know a lot about wood design for residential cases because houses are mostly built out of wood these days. Uh, then they're going to know a little bit about steel design because occasionally you'll get a huge house to some really big beam and you just can't use a wood beam or it'll be really expensive too. Um, so you're going to know some steel as well. And a good engineer is going to have a general idea of which local materials are available. So when you're specifying beams, there's multiple types of materials you could select for the same beam. And sometimes some materials are cheaper. Sometimes people like to buy a certain kind of beam. It just depends on who's building the house. Sometimes a builder likes to use a certain thing. Um, sometimes things are not available. Sometimes there's like a glue lamb beam crisis and nobody can get them. So you got to start designing everything with LVLs instead. Um, it's sort of a, a little bit of a game you got to play because there's multiple solutions to the same, same problem, same design. So it's good to know the local materials that are available because it'll save people money. Simpson Strong Tie is a website or it is a company that makes all kinds of metal hardware for houses. If you have seen a metal hanger or a metal strap or something in a house, it is probably made by Simpson Strong Tie. And they have all kinds of charts and things. So a good engineer is going to be familiar with the kind of information that Simpson has to present. And of course, a good engineer is going to have some background trade knowledge on how structures are built so that they can help design things to make it easier for those people to build them. What tools? Does a structural engineer use? Well, they could use multiple different tools. Sometimes they're homemade tools like Excel files and things like that. But in this particular case, 
in my past as an engineer, I did use Chief Architect, which is an architectural drawing program. It's not an engineering calculating program or anything like that. But it is capable of showing in three dimensions all of the framing or a lot of the framing of the house that is being built. And sometimes you can catch important things that are going to happen uh, because a lot of what happens when an engineer is designing and looking at an architectural plan is he has to visualize in his head exactly what this house is going to be look what this house is going to look like when it's framed in order to say, well, there needs to be a beam here for this or this needs to be here for this. And so sometimes using software to help visualize can save somebody some time. But a lot of engineers' work is going to be simply drafted in AutoCAD. The architects are going to output a certain type of file, a DWG file, a drawing file. And basically what the engineers can do is we can we can take that and we can remove a bunch of extra information off of it, leave original lines, and then start drawing beams and stuff on it. So in that plan that you just saw, the PDF, the original lines on that piece of paper were not drawn by the engineer. They actually came from the architect's drawing. So modern software allows us to pull those lines and speed up the process, basically. So we don't draw things on paper anymore for a good reason. And of course, to do their calculations in wood and a little bit of steel, most of the residential world, people are using Forte Web. It is a software that was created by a wood brand, a, a, a company that distributes and sells wood. Um, it was created to market that those particular products that they make, but it is capable of designing lots of different things. And it's free. So it is, it's a cool tool to use, cool tool to play with. And we were actually going to do just a little bit of exactly that. So I'm going to switch over to Forte Web. We are going to do that. So this is an online software and it is very convenient. Everything is stored on the cloud. And we are going to look through one specific situation here just to show you what basically what the software kind of can do. So we're going to look at one particular beam and I'm actually going to go back and reference the plan that we were looking at. in the second floor ceiling there was this very large beam that i said was a five and a half inch by 19 and a half inch glue lamb beam 20 feet long it was a big big beam carrying lots of weight well why is that labeled that way we're going to try to find out so in the software you are going to first of all see some, oh, let me switch back, make sure, make sure I switch back. So the software is not particularly intelligent in that it can look at your situation and know what to do. The software is good at doing math, a lot of math, very quickly with proper input information. So if you put bad information in the software, it's going to tell you a certain thing. And that thing may or may not be true. It may or may, may, or may not pass or fail. Um, the key is to properly understand what the software is looking for so that you know you got a realistic solution. So on the, the way this works is I have on the left side is this menu and I just picked living right left. That means that I'm in the living room and the beam is running right left. It's a it's it's horizontal. There's not a vertical on the plan. So the beam is selected i'm in the member info tab which is basically just i could write some notes i could say what's my deflection criteria here what this basically means is there's a code minimum which is we don't want the beam to deflect in the center deflect meaning bow or bend down under the weight that it's holding uh, the code minimum is l over 360 so if my beam was 360 feet long i would deflect in the center one i would deflect one foot down so that, all that's meaning is the deflection is related to the length of the span of the beam. So if my beam is spanning 360 inches, I would be deflecting in the center one inch down. So depending on what 
finishes you have, she rocks, stuff like that, how big the beam is spanning, you want to be careful with this deflection because if things bow too much, then they will bow a lot more over time and they might crack sheetrock and stuff. So what we did here is we went to a high deflection criteria, L over 600. So that means this is going to be a stiffer beam. It is going to bow less under weight and time. And that's just going to kind of set some things up for the, the report at the end. Next thing is going to be spans and supports. So the beam is a horizontal thing that is spanning from one wall to another. So I want to say, well, how far do I have to go? Right. In this case, it's 18 foot, two inches. So, and then I can describe the end condition. Am I sitting on a wall? Am I sitting on a steel plate? What is the wall made out of? Um, do I have accessories? Am I blocking the end of the beam? Is the beam restrained from like falling over left or to right um, at, the, at the wall itself? Stuff like that. How, how often is the beam braced? So if I take a beam and I spin it in a clear open space between one spot and another, it is not braced anywhere in the center. If I, let's say, put a floor system on top of that, and I, I've got a whole bunch of nails in my OSB floor system nailed into this beam, the beam is restrained from moving horizontally, and it's, it's effectively braced. So that makes the beam stronger because it's not going to try to move in that direction as much. So you can describe that kind of thing. In the loads tab, you can put all kinds of loading information on like what is this beam going to carry this is the part that is tricky to wrap your head around requires engineering background or some math background to really grasp what weights are being placed on this beam to know that you're active like you're accurately defining the problem here if you don't accurately define the loads then you don't really know how much you're carrying and it's not going to do good math for you so uh, there's different kinds of loads and placements and dead loads, live loads, roof loads, snow loads, wind loads. There's there's a lot of background information to know on how to load these things. But the basic premise is, if you wanted to keep it simple, a point load, which is just at this particular loca location, there's going to be, let's say, 2,300 pounds of dead weight, uh, which is effectively like the building load itself. So buildings weigh something. When you put all this wood and steel and stuff together, it weighs a lot. So you have to account for that. And then live loads are like, okay, we're going to put furniture in the house later. And there's going to be people in the house later. And there's going to be this in the house later. Um, so they account for these. They factor these things because they it's all part of the math that, that makes sense. So that is why the loads are separated out in that way. Um, but you're going to put some loads on the beam. And then in the whole section, you can define if someone's going to be a drill. If you need to like drill a big four-inch hole somewhere for a pipe, you can put that hole in here and see if it, it has a problem or affects the beam. A lot of times it doesn't. Sometimes it does. Uh, but this is where you would find out. And location analysis isn't really helpful. It does something that we don't really use. And the product selection is where you're going to basically start guessing. The way this software works is you're going to get this how this is intended to work. So I know this particular brand, Warehouser, who wrote Forte, when he created the code, the business program, their product of a laminated veneer lumber engineer beam product is called Microlam. So I'm going to select Microlam LVL. It is one and three quarter wide, 2.0 E stiffness. That is the product that I can select here. And then I'm going to just say, how deep is this thing? Is it 18 inches deep, 24 inches deep? Is it only five and a half inches deep? And of course, I'm going to select how many plies. How many of these things am I going to put together to make this beam? In this case, I said four plies of 18-inch LVL is going to make this beam. And when I've done that, I just go to solutions, and it's going to tell me information about what that what happened here. So it's going to tell me how much weight is on the end of my beam. I can use that number to figure out, well, what kind of studs do I need in my wall to hold that weight? Um, it's going to have percentages. How Did it pass or fail by how much? What is the deflection? I'm way over my... Uh, required L over 600 on the LMS uh, 969. Over here, it's a little easier to tell the live load deflection and total load deflection. So theoretically, if all of the dead weight and all of the live weight was applied all at the same time, then you would have 0.465 inches of deflection in the center of that beam downward. That is not very much, and that is probably a load situation that will never happen. So it's not a concern. So, 
and the moment is basically the the thing that's going to break the beam. If if this number gets closer to eighty, that's sort of an uncomfortable place to be. Um, you don't really want to get too close because if you start exceeding this, then when you maximum load the beam, it might actually break. Most beams are designed to deflection limits, as in we don't want them to be super bendy. A lot like rarely is a beam ever designed to actually breaking strength. So, and the report is just the last sheet that summarizes all the information, says everything that you put in here, clarifies things, uh, tells you the weight of the beam, all kinds of stuff. So, that is Forte Web. That is how each individual beam is analyzed and put into place. So, there's a lot of math that goes into putting a plan like this together because you have to understand where all the weights are, how much does everything weigh, standard. Um, What's going to catch what? You have to visualize in 3D. How are they going to put it together? How is it going to get caught? In this particular example, we have two other beams coming in here in the floor system, and there's going to be metal hangers that are going to catch those and be placed on this beam. So you could understand that in a complicated house with lots of beams, this is very time-consuming because you have to check every single beam. And not only that, but now I have this, this guy, this beam over here that is like vertical on the plan. It's going to catch in this hanger number one. Well, I guess I got to go pick out what hanger one is going to supposed to be because it needs to hold up the weight of that beam. So I got to go check my math, find a hanger that works, and then put that load on this beam. And it's all part of the math and it's all part of the game that is putting a structural plan together. So I'm going to share back to the PowerPoint now. But that is Forte Web. That is a one of the softwares that, is, that can be used to calculate wood members and some steel members and stuff like that. So what tools can anybody use? Well, technically anybody can create a, create a free account on Forte Web. Um, the drawback to that is that it requires a lot of background information to know how to use the thing. When I go into more advanced stuff, I might talk about how to, how to get into some of that. But you do need to keep in mind that you can intentionally, not intentionally, you can accidentally produce a bad design by not understanding inputs or making a mistake. Mistakes happen from engineers as well. And when it's, you may understand the full process, but it's like, oh, I happened to forget this load because I wasn't paying attention or something like that. So you gotta watch out for stuff like that. Double check everything. And that's kind of why you pretty much always want an engineer with a license to look over everything at the end of the day anyway, um, because it's gonna be safer. So if you wanna learn more about structural engineering for residential cases, um, or engineering in general. There's a book called To Engineers Human. It is a book written about failures of engineering and, and why engineering things fail and how they fail and lessons learned and things like that. It's a good one. You can glance through chapters four, five, six, and eight of the 2021 International Residential Code online. That is a free thing online. Four, five, six, and eight are the chapters where all that information in the structural plan was were pulled from. All the notes and all the stuff. If you can get used to reading code language, you can learn a lot about, okay, if I want to build something, literally, how many nails do I use? Where do they go? What size are they? You know, how do I cut the wood out? Where am I allowed to cut the wood out? This kind of stuff. So you can do that. You can watch the Essential Craftsman YouTube channel. There is a video called Structural Engineering, Things You Need to Know, Episode 6 of the Spec House series. He talks a little bit about how he interacts with his structural engineer to build that spec house. That's a good one. You're going to see a little bit more of the contractor's side just because he is a, he's the guy building the house. And you're, you're going to see less of from the engineering side. But theoretically, after I've shown you some of the background, you're going to understand what that engineer had to do with his house. And of course, you can play around with Forte web materials and stuff if you really want to get an idea for things like, well, what happens if I put 200 pounds of dead weight on three two by sixes over an eight foot span? You know, can I hold something up? Can I do that? Is that going to work out? Is it going to be okay? Um, but if you want to poke around more, you can do that. But that marks the end of the summary of engineering structural design. So. Thank you.